I'm Caleb Benjamin, intern at Lawfare with an episode from the Lawfare Archive for January 1st, 2024. Over the past few months, several pieces in Lawfare have reflected on the historical context of current events, whether that be the 50th anniversary of the War Powers Resolution, the Justice Department's first ever war crimes prosecution, how the October 7th attack and subsequent response are and aren't similar to 9-11, and more. For today's Archive episode, I picked an episode from September 26th, 2014, in which Benjamin Wittes sat down with Dan Carlin to discuss his podcast, Hardcore History, where he delves into history in very long and very involved episodes, his series on World War I, his views on NSA surveillance and U.S. military operations, and more. I'm Benjamin Wittes, and this is the Lawfare Podcast, September 27th, 2014. That's the voice of Dan Carlin, podcaster extraordinaire, creator of both the Hardcore History and the Common Sense podcasts. Over the past several months, Carlin has been on the Hardcore History podcast doing a project that will be of intense interest to many Lawfare listeners, a giant series on World War I. It's rich, it's riveting, and it's at great length. Meanwhile, over at Common Sense, Carlin takes on NSA surveillance, which he hates, and U.S. interventions overseas, which he really hates, in a eclectic political podcast that everyone will find something to disagree with in. I caught up with him by phone in a wide-ranging conversation earlier this week. It's the Lawfare Podcast, Episode 93, Hardcore Dan Carlin. So let's start with hardcore history. When I, if, if, if somebody had told me that I would be completely mesmerized by a podcast that compo- composed of a guy talking for anywhere from two to four hours about uh, events in, in world history of often a very grisly nature, I would have been skeptical. And yet I... I find that when one of those episodes comes on, and particularly these latest set of episodes about World War I, I can't uh, shut it off. And I'm, I'm, I'd like to start just, you know, where, where did you get the idea for this, and, and how did the podcast develop? Well, I always tell the same story. It was my mother-in-law's idea, actually. Um, I, I've always been a history person, um, ever since I was a little kid, and... Uh, I was a history major in college, uh, and, and I was a talk radio show host who talked about politics and current events like a lot of talk radio show hosts did. And when we got into podcasting, we started a podcast that, that did very much what we did on the radio, politics and current events and all that, with sort of a historical uh, tie-in. And then I was uh, having a dinner discussion around the family dinner table one night, and my mother-in-law asked why we didn't do a podcast where I told some of these same stories I was telling at the dinner table, and I tried to explain to her that, you know, as a person with a with a bachelor's degree in history, I didn't really have the qualifications to, to talk history like a historian would, for example. And she had a great comeback line. She said, I didn't realize you had to be a historian to tell stories. And I thought to myself for a minute, hmm, that's a very good point. And then I thought, you know, before the modern era where where history really became the 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 the, the area that only scholars really ventured into that's what people who taught history or wrote history did. I mean, the, the so-called father of history, Herodotus, certainly wouldn't have met any of the academic criteria required today to teach history, for example. And so I thought to myself, well, you know, as long as I'm using qualified historians and as long as I'm explaining to the audience the disagreements that even qualified historians have over some of this stuff, that I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be sort of practicing medicine without a license. Does that make sense? As somebody who practices law without a license, you know, it, 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 I, I'm sympathetic to the idea of, 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 of a kind of good-natured uh, uh, refusal to allow the profession uh, to dominate something that actually belongs to a much wider array of people. But I, I guess my my question is: other history podcasts that I've heard, they tend to be relatively brief. The episodes they tend to be um, 
a, a fair bit less analytical. Um, but you, when you take on a subject, you are not afraid of people having to stick with it for a long time. I mean, three and a half hours is a long time for an episode. Where, where did you get, how did you develop confidence that people would stick with an episode that long? Is that, is that something that developed over time? Is it a personal charisma thing? Is it a radio talk show host thing? What, you know, where does it come from? Well, it definitely evolved over time. The very first episode we did was only 15 minutes long. And, and I think I assumed that that's what it was going to be like. And for a long time, we had these artificial constraints on us. I remember the first uh, episode we ever had that went over 60 minutes. We were absolutely pulling our hair out over how could we do this? You know, how could we go over 60 minutes? No one's going to stick with us. And the audience encouraged us to just go farther and farther. And at a certain point, we started doing stories that were so complex. And, you know, we're not choosing these little teeny snippets. We're choosing big conflicts and, and deep subjects. And eventually you started to realize, or I guess we started to realize, that, that, you know, our job is to be faithful to the material. And if, and if it's doing a disservice to the material to give it less time than it warrants, well, in a sense, we're cheating the audience. And it was the audience that said, no, 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 you know, do whatever it takes to do it right. And so I think you're absolutely right. It was something that evolved over time and, and that the audience said, listen, we like it this way. Don't worry, don't worry about the length. And I, I would even argue whether or not podcast is a proper term for what we do now. I think it's almost more, um, accurate to call it an audio book, certainly in terms of the expectations of people who've never heard us before. If you tell them it's an audio book, they won't be surprised by either the length or how long they have to wait between episodes. If you call it a podcast, I think it, both of those things will end up surprising them. Right. Podcasting is really the medium by which you deliver a the product. The product is kind of its own thing. Yes, it's a distribution mechanism, exactly. So how do you, what is the process for putting together one of these episodes? I mean, these episodes are incredibly richly researched, both in secondary and often in primary sources. They're, um, they sound very conversational, uh, i.e. not scripted. On the other hand, there are, there are no pauses and filler words in it. It's, I mean, it's, it, it reads like, it sounds like it's coming off a, a script almost written to sound like it's not there. What's the, what's the process by which you put one of these things together? Well, there is no script. So if it sounds like there is no script, that, that's accurate. Um, <laughs> it, it, again, it, it, it evolved over a fit. The original concept behind this was that we were going to do a program for people that already knew the story that it was going to be something akin to what history majors would talk about on their lunch break between classrooms, you know, the, the weird twilight zone type strangeness of historical events. And so when we started this, we didn't really give much background. We sort of just picked up, hey, isn't it interesting how when the Roman Republic fell, this happened? And, and we started very quickly to realize that the people that were starting to enjoy the program enjoyed those weird musings but didn't know the story. And so, so we thought, okay, well, we'll give more background so that the musings themselves can be enjoyed. And, again, it evolved. You know, we used to say, and, and this is how every radio talk show I ever did was too, you know, your favorite TV series was not your favorite TV series for the first several episodes. It takes a while for it to evolve into what it's going to be. And the creator has some control over that, but, but in a sense it's also part of an evolutionary process that has a mind of its own. And so due to audience feedback and also our ability to grow and, and explore new avenues, um, it developed into what it is, which, which is a combination both of those historical musings that we originally started out with and the background information that then gives context to that. And we always said that the formula itself involves three things. Nar narrative history, which is, you know, the facts and the, and, and the story. Uh, the drama, which is something that I always wanted to convey, because all of these things, that's what the oral historians in traditional societies did such a great job of, and, and what popular histories today do, where it, they, they bring you the drama of the moment, and they're able to capture um, the intensity of these events in a way that, that, it, that, that enhances and engages your emotions. And then finally, things that we call twists, 
Mists, which are these Twilight Zone-type musings that I always thought history majors used to share over lunch hour between classes. And so those three things woven together like three strands of a rope is kind of the, the formula for the program. And, 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 again, that's something that evolved over time. I can't claim credit for having sat down one day and said, wouldn't it be great if I could do these three things and make them work? But there is no script. Um, I basically go into the studio. Um, I do have note cards with page numbers of primary sources. So I'll say, uh, I have this one book. I want to quote this second paragraph on page 43, and that will be in my hand somewhere. And when I get to the natural part of the story where it seems likely that that's applicable, you know, I'll, I'll go, okay, oh, I've got this book, page 43, it says on the note card, and I'll include that primary source. And then when I run out of gas or the, or the story just sort of falls apart, um, I'll stop, and then the next day we'll walk back in the studio and, and, and pick up from where we left off and then string those pieces together. So it's several or 20 or 30 sections um, strung together is the way mm-hmm, it works out. Mm-hmm. And, and what's the... What's the universe of people who are downloading this? How many how many listeners do you have? Um, well, a better way to put it, it, it it's tough because people will say, like a magazine subscription or a newspaper uh, distribution, they'll say, how many listeners do you have? I have no way of knowing that. It's more like a book or a record or CD sales where I can say, I've sold this many copies of this book. I can tell you how many downloads, for example, of each show we have. So... On average, say the last ten episodes we've done, uh, they they have over two million uh, downloads each. That's and astonishing. So, so by contrast, the Lawfare podcast has about a thousand downloads per per episode. Well, you're on your way. We had a thousand downloads at one point. So <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's it's all a process of eventually getting to there. Let's talk about World War One. Uh, this is an area where. You know, our readership is composed uh, largely of national security lawyers, a lot of whom are, you know, very versed in, particularly on the military side, very versed in in, in the history of this, you know, of conflict in general. Um, and I'm fascinated by, uh, you know, the World War One history is a is a history that I I've sort of known in in general terms, but the the richness of the of the four now episodes that you've done on it is really stunning and i'm 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 interested just in in your thoughts on the 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 process of telling a story that horrible that has been largely forgotten or at least the the details of which have been largely forgotten outside of you know sort of historical and military circles Well, first of all, you're very kind. I really appreciate uh, And I've appreciated all the feedback that we've gotten. I mean, I think we've been very lucky. I'm bracing myself for the day that that it turns on me and goes in the other direction. Um, So, yeah, we've been very lucky with people enjoying this. And and the First World War, as you said, it's such a rich topic to mine. Um, The the converse angle, though, on that is that there's so much out there. Um, We do, obviously, a lot of reading for these things. and, And comparing... The First World War is something like, let's just say, Alexandrian uh, Macedonia, and the amount of material we have to go through is, um, let's just put it this way, we've never ever had to do the kind of reading we've had to do for this, and it's not just the fact that there's, it's such a recent event that there's so much out there, but there are so many countries involved in this that you have to mine sources from, from many different, uh, you know, I mean, we, we're, I'm reading books from French veterans and German veterans, and, and it just... It increases exponentially the amount of reading we have to do, but but that also provides so many different angles you can work with. One, one of the things we try to do on the program, and it's difficult, as you might imagine, for example, if you're talking about the Second World War, is not pick good and evil and good guys and bad guys and, and try to show uh, very often I, I try to take a human approach to this because that's how I think about these things. You know, when I read history, and I think a lot of people who enjoy history are able to enjoy history because they put themselves into those situations and say, God, how would I react if that were me? So for the First World War, for example, um, I was a military history major, and, and, and for me, I can pinpoint specific battles in world history that I can't imagine being in. But nowhere do I find as many of those sorts of situations where you just think, God, this would be the most horrifying place to be on any given day than in the First World War. And part of what made it so terrible 
is the static nature of it. So whereas the Second World War, I mean, you wouldn't want to be at, at many of those battles either. The First World War made it worse by making sure you had to fight in the same place where people were were fighting a year before and two years before and three years before with all of the bodies and the debris and the trash and the moonscape that that those battlefields became. I mean, the battle of Ypres, the battles at Ypres, there were three uh, up 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 in Belgium. I mean, they they say you could smell the battlefield before you got there, and it's because it didn't move. And, and 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 it was just mired in mud, and people had to just live in these environments that were so hellish. So for me, you know, I mean, everybody when they try to tell a story picks the parts of the story uh, that appeals to them, and they tell the story a little differently. For me, I just looked at it from the point of view of, of imagine being there. And so a lot of our work focuses on the individuals in the story and trying to give you some sort of using primary sources mostly a feeling for what those people were living through. And, and often I find it prompts a real admiration for their fortitude and their ability to endure. And I often, you know, I'm, I may be a weak 21st century person, but oftentimes it's unfathomable to me. And, and that's what I try to convey. So you, you spend a lot of time in these episodes on the unfathomability of it to a person of our sort of, you know, pampered um modern comfort-based existence and that does not grow up in the sort of honor culture of the 19th century uh, French, German, or British militaries um, or, or the, the honor cultures of, of the societies that produce those militaries. I'm wondering if you, you know, to what extent you've thought about, uh, and I'm sure you have, the relationship between the military's that existed then, which are, you know, and and the militaries that, you know, we send out in the field today, um, they're, you know, which are of course much smaller, um, you know, they're they 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 don't tend to be uh, intergenerational in quite the same way of of sort of you know these these families like the you know the von Moltkes or. or um, and they don't tend to be, you know, quite the same, um, as you point out, sort of honor cultures that, that un throughout the society that, that underlie them. How does that change, um, when, when we think about, you know, there's a, 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 a new campaign starting against ISIS as of last night, right? Um, what's the difference between the, the cultural difference between the military we send out to do those things and the militaries that you're thinking about when, 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 when you put these episodes together? Well, I, I think it's part of the reason that the, and I think it's a little funny actually when I think about it now, but the entire first episode of this series we've done in the First World War, I think focuses more on Napoleon and the Napoleonic era because that's the era where the idea of mass conscript armies involving the mass of the population really takes hold because, you know, you can go back to Homer's Iliad and you see the warrior culture of humankind that's been in existence since prehistoric times that's always been a facet of human society. I mean, obviously there are exceptions here and there, but by and large the idea of a, of a warrior caste in societies is, is, is pretty universal. And I would argue that, that we still have that today. The Napoleonic era, though, forced societies that didn't want to have mass armies because having the population armed in a lot of these societies was the worst nightmare of a lot of, of, a lot of these monarchies who, who wanted nothing less than to have their people armed and dangerous, but were forced to because of the challenge posed by the French Revolution and French revolutionary-sized armies, mass armies, the, the era of, of mass mobilization, and total war, which is what the First World War really inaugurates. And so the, the 19th century and the early 20th century is this period, as you pointed out, where you're dealing with, with I think I think the French mobilized 18 or 19 percent of their entire population to fight. I mean, so many people that they were having problems um, uh, uh, staffing industries and, and, and the arms manufactories and the shells couldn't even be made unless the, the state 
turned to almost what was you know, called war socialism so that the government could, could put workers in the most advantageous places because so many people were, were in the military. Um, today, at least in, in the West, we've reverted more to a warrior caste kind of system where we have these people that do the fighting. They're a small percentage of the tip of the spear of the society, you might say, and, and it's, it's more normal. So in a sense, you could almost see this period from about, I don't know, 1789 to 19, maybe the, the early 1970s when Richard Nixon ended the draft uh, in the United States as, as this period that, that we thought was going to be the modern world's typical military, and maybe now it's more of the uh, uh, of the anomaly. Uh, entire societies mobilized at the drop of a hat. I mean, even if you look at Western Europe, and even if you look at some of the conversations that have had since the situation in Ukraine boiled over, where everyone is starting to think maybe, maybe Europe is a little under-militarized considering uh, the historic levels that, that they were accustomed to, no one is talking about going back to those kinds of levels of, of mass conscription and everything. And so um, to get back to your question, I, I think that the United States military today, there, there, there was a book, I think it was Kaplan who wrote a book called Imperial Grunts, and, and, and it's, it's very much, I think, what we have here. We have uh, a kind of a Roman legionary sort of imperial force. And, and truthfully, if you look at the tip of the spear, I mean, the support levels, uh, uh, I mean, there's very few actual soldiers doing the fighting. Um, I mean, what's our, what's our military today? I mean, you look at the numbers and it's probably what, the tip of the spear is probably 8, 10% of the people. So, so um, very unlike what they were dealing with in the First World War or the Second World War, or even if you look at con conscription levels in the 1950s and 1960s here in the United States or Europe or the Soviet Union. Um, and, and I think it's, it's, it's done that way because it's easier on the society. I mean, Richard Nixon famously thought that he could get the, um, the, the, the anti-war rallies to dissipate somewhat if, if people weren't being drafted against their will. And when the draft went away, sure enough, those, those, those rallies did shrink. And so I think this is an attempt to make conflict more palatable to a society, especially if that conflict is going on for long periods of time, volunteer so that, militaries as opposed to conscript militaries. So that's a great transition. Um, you have another podcast, and, and, and when I, I, I so enjoyed um, Hardcore History that I – when I started listening to Common Sense, I expected to agree with you all the time. Um, well, nobody does that. <laughs> and I was uh, actually quite surprised um, at the um, vehemence with which I often did not. Um, and so I was, uh, I'm interested, you know, the, the, the Common Sense podcast has a, a fairly strongly anti-interventionist streak, both recently um, with respect to uh, cer certainly with respect to Ukraine and a sort of sense of uh, of of caution in in uh, in dealing with that situation, but also with respect to um, you know all the various Middle Eastern um, and um, further east than that interventions that the U.S. has been involved in. And I'm interested in, you know, sort of what's the relationship between the historical podcasts and your contemporary views of, of national security issues and, and military issues. Well, I'm able to separate those completely, and I think I think I think the fact that you like one and don't like the other is, is a sign of that. Oh, I didn't um, say I didn't like it. I said I I I, dis, I I find myself disagreeing with well, it. Well, you know what, and, and I, should, I should correct that because it is one of the things I love about the audience that they're willing to listen to something. I always say that it, from a political sense, I'm a political Martian, and I say that because I don't have a constituency. There's no one that agrees with me about everything, and I don't want them to. Uh, and I'm perfectly comfortable with that, and I wish more people were because we could have more interesting conversations. I think if, if people were willing to, to hear me out and then say I'm an idiot on certain things, but then still tune in next week to, to hear what I have to say. Um, I am more of an old-fashioned American. And by that I mean, uh, if you look at the United States' as political arguments in the 19th century, for example, for their view of, of foreign intervention, that is much more what I'm like than um, the, the post-Second World War 
uh, attitude of the United States in terms of its 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 indispensable nation, to use a phrase, uh, responsibility in world affairs. I'm much more of, um, I mean, if you said we're going to go back to an era where the United States should have no permanent entangling alliances in a George Washington, John Adams sort of sense, um, that, that would be fine with me. And um, yet you have, you have quite the intellectual crush on Theodore Roosevelt. Well, well, no, I'm not an intellectual crush. I, I, I have, a, I have an intellectual crush on in Alexander the Great, but I certainly wouldn't want to live under him. Um, <laughs> they're, 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 they're fantastically interesting people, and and I don't have to agree with their politics or, or have wanted to vote for them or live under them um, uh, to have such an intellectual crush. I like Churchill too, uh, but far too imperial for my taste. But that doesn't that doesn't diminish how absolutely wonderfully fascinating and intriguing and amusing, you know, they are. Um, and, and, and maybe that even ties into that idea of how an audience that disagrees with me so strongly on a lot of issues can continue to listen and like the program. Um, and, and I think in a sense, you know, I was raised in a household of people that felt very like 19th century Americans. I mean, sure, for this latest episode, um, I am researching uh, Woodrow Wilson and the United States' debates over the entry into the war in 1917. Now, I know all this stuff because I don't pick topics uh, for these conversations that I don't already know a lot about because I have to build on top of that foundation <laughs> in order to do the program. And it's so interesting um, reading the debates in 1917 in the United States, because that's where you see so much of that old-fashioned American anti-interventionist attitude. And, of course, the United States was never anti-interventionist. Just ask the Mexicans about that, right? I mean, or ask the Canadians about that. But the idea of going far overseas with large military forces is, is an un-American tendency until the 20th century. And so... That's really where where my sympathies lie. I, I don't buy into the 20th century idea that the United States should be the policeman of the world. And in fact, to use a term that's probably going to strike a lot of your listeners as somewhat um, harsh, I think that's un-American in the traditional sense of the word. Um, go read the Founding Fathers. None of those people, not even someone like Hamilton, who was a guy who, who foresaw us rivaling Europe's military at some time, saw us going overseas and, and, and involving ourselves militarily all over the world, uh, it, it, to them, part of the reason that liberty, you know, that, that word that was so important to them, would be endangered is by large permanent standing militaries. Well, and, the other and hand, that's how I it, feel, too. It didn't take Jefferson long after the founding to go overseas um, and you know engage in an overseas military operation. You're talking about the Barbary pirates and stuff? Yeah. Yeah, okay, but that's a, that, that's almost, almost something one could call a special operation. Uh, the United <laughs> States has also used Marines. Uh, I mean, we, we used Marines in the 1800s in Korea. Um, uh, those, those sorts of things have happened, but there's a very big difference between something like that and deciding to send millions of men across the Atlantic to fight on European soil in a general war. So what's the, in, in, in the contemporary world, according to Dan Carlin, how does the government of the United States respond? How should we respond intellectually, and how does the government of the United States respond functionally to ISIL or to, you know, the incursion in Ukraine? Well, I think it would be instructive. And, you know, as a history person, and I know many of your listeners are going to be history people too, I wish we would look at how our activities along these lines have fared for us over time. I would make the argument that so much of what we're dealing with now in the Middle East is a response to things we've already done. I think in the last Common Sense program we did, I brought up, I guess, what's a heretical idea, that the Middle East would probably be better today, and I think certainly the United States would be much better today, had we never had the first Gulf War. I mean, if Saddam Hussein had taken over Kuwait and we'd let him, or conversely, and this assumes that you buy the, the story that, that Saddam had asked whether the United States would have any problem in advance um, about going into Kuwait and the whole Gillespie question. Um, but but had, we, had we warned Saddam off and said, yes, you go into Kuwait and we'll have a problem, and he said, okay, I won't, well, we would have a much better situation involved in the Middle East today, and we, we might not have had 9-11 happen. Uh, there are 
interviews with um, Osama bin Laden, he did several with Robert Fisk, where, where he pointed out that the entire reason for striking the United States was because we had military forces near Mecca and Medina in Saudi Arabia, and that was intolerable to, to Muslims of his ilk. Uh, I think you could make a case that the reason for advocating less involvement in the Middle East, for example, is because the involvement that we've already done in the Middle East has not worked out well for us. If we were actually looking at results, I would make the case to you that we've, we've reaped a bitter harvest and that those who argue that we have to intervene to maintain stability are arguing against what the facts on the ground have already shown what previous interventions have done. One of the interesting things about you is when I listen to you talk that way, I cannot tell whether I should think of you more as a sort of Rand Paul libertarian conservative or more as a kind of uh, left Dennis Kucinich type liberal. How, how do you, other than Martian like, how do you identify your own political worldview? I, 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 I don't fit into any of those categories because I'm a fiscally conservative person, uh, but I think you can't get around the idea of needing some kind of universal health care. Um, I'm a socially liberal person, uh, and yet at the same time, I don't think you can legalize all drugs, for example. Um, I guess what I'm saying is if I found someone who had my political beliefs, I'm sure I would latch onto them, but nobody really does. Uh, I, supposedly, if my listeners are to be believed, I have a contingent of them who say that they agree with what I say, but they just may be following along, for all I know. I think human beings have a, have a tendency to do that sometimes. Um, no, I, I, I say politically Martian because there is no label that accurately describes me. I, and sometimes I go on these um, these political talk shows, and they'll spend the entire time that we have, rather than doing what you're doing and discussing things, they'll want to pin me down and try to figure out which label fits, and by the end of the program, usually I can get them to agree that no label fits, and then we've wasted our entire time trying to, to find a label. Believe me, it would be a lot easier for me if I could do that, because it would be shorthand. We could just sort of cut to the chase and say, okay, now I know where you stand, and we can move along. But but I don't fit because I think, I, truthfully, in my own view, I think our system is so out of whack that, that anyone who's focused, as I am, on solving problems rather than having them some adhere to some sort of ideology, um, that, that the problems that we have are so diverse that there is no ideology that fixes them. It's a case-by-case -case basis kind of thing. And so I'm kind of an a la carte political um, figure, I guess you could say. So a lot of the readers of our site are, are people in the intelligence community of one sort or another. They have been, as you know, under you know, incredible stress over the last year and a half as a result of the Snowden revelations and, and you know, other things. And, and a lot of people who did not previously think much about intelligence um, and signals intelligence in particular have become, uh, have come to have very strong feelings about the subject as a result of I think the, the fact that, you know, signals intelligence didn't used to interfere or engage in the same space as people lived their day-to-day -day lives, but with the advent of the Internet, now it does, right? I mean, you know, the, the people you're spying on use the same infrastructure as everybody else does, and you end up engaging on that infrastructure in a way that people have much more reason to be concerned about than, than they used to. I'm curious for your whole your thoughts about um, about the whole sort of NSA affair and how we should engage it with you know a historical consciousness about the role that signals intelligence has played in past conflict with all your suspicion about contemporary conflicts and engagements that we get involved in and with a certain you know suspicion of government power that that is reflected in a lot of your, your work. What do you make of it all? Well, let's first say that that suspicion of government power, which, of course, as you all know, dates back to the founding of the republic. I mean, we're a country founded on suspicion of government power. Um, I, I'm going to, and, and perhaps improperly, my, my apologies to the sig, sig, signal intel, signals intelligence folks in your audience to lump them in with the general intelligence services as a whole, but listen, the intelligence services of the United States are repeat offenders when it comes to 
violations of constitutional protections and all kinds of other things. Um, and, and that's what I try to get across to people when they bring this up to me. Why are you suspicious uh, of, of the intelligence services, for example? And I say because they've done things in the past to warrant that suspicion. I mean, the reason we have, for example, a FISA court is that's a reform from one of several um, expose periods in our history where the malfeasance of the intelligence service is going after people that they shouldn't have gone after, violating constitutional principles that they shouldn't have violated happen. And so the reason that we're suspicious is because these folks have proven that they need to be watched carefully. The reason we have uh, intelligence committees that oversee uh, the NSA, for example, among other intelligence agencies today is an attempt to find some sort of reform to prevent uh, a recurrence of what's happened in the past. And so I think the suspicion comes from, I mean, I mean I'll give you an example. We'll talk about Edward Snowden, and, and I'll have folks from the intelligence agencies explain to me how much damage they think Edward Snowden has done, and I'll tell them, well, it's your fault. It's completely your fault, because if you had listened to people like Thomas Drake or William Binney or internal whistleblowers who tried to explain to you that you had these problems, or if you had um, gone to people in the on the intelligence committee, say, say a Ron Wyden or a Udall in Colorado, and you had allowed these people to deal with these kinds of concerns in a way that would have been more responsible and, and less extreme, then this stuff could have been dealt with through the channels that had been established based on the last time that there was overreach in intelligence agency responsibility. But, you can, but because people like General Michael Hayden kept the lid on this sort of stuff, then they, and, and this is traditional, this has happened in the past, then it all explodes. I mean, this is what you had with the church and the Pike Committee hearings in the 70s, where, you know, you're showing the, the gadgetry and the wizardry of, our, of the crown jewels, as they were called, of the CIA on national television. And everyone's freaking out, but had they not done what they had done and not tried to circumvent, you know, the, the, the elements that are the oversight functions of government, none of that would have happened. So this is a, a tendency, and the reason that, that I'm, I'm not very sympathetic is because these folks need to live within the confines of this system, and this system has constraints. Now, the Fourth Amendment may seem dangerous in, in, in a world like ours with terrorism and people flying planes into buildings and whatnot, but I think if you went to the American people and said, that they should get rid of the Fourth Amendment, for example, because it's too dangerous, you're not going to win that argument. So trying to circumvent it or fill it full of Swiss cheese loopholes and whatnot because you can't get it repealed is not going to get much sympathy either. So the reason that I'm hard on the intelligence services is because they've proven that they need to be. And I would suggest that the, the Snowden revelations are another wonderful example that it's time to change the way we do oversight. And I, I've got some ideas for, for things I'd like to see, but but I'm not as sympathetic as most people are. I get angry at them. You, you want to say, look, signals intelligence is a perfect example of something that's very important. And, and when you screw it up by going too far and not listening to your own internal whistleblowers, and when you violate your own internal rules about whistleblowers, you're the one that prompts these kind of things. And you screw up our intelligence by doing that. They're blaming the people who tell the public about it. The truth is the public never needed to know about most of this stuff if the proper policies have been followed. Listen, I would change the way the intelligence committees work. I would have the Senate Intelligence Committee be allowed, instead of having to have a majority vote for the Senate Intelligence Committee people to tell the public uh, about things that they think are wrong, I would say that if two members on the Senate Intelligence Committee feel that the public needs to know about something, I would have let Ron Wyden and Udall from Colorado come forward and give a very narrow interpretation to the people of the United States about where they thought things had gone too far in terms of the way that the intelligence agencies and the government was interpreting certain parts of the Patriot Act. That, to me, would have, would have totally circumvented the need for a Edward Snowden. And if I can believe, and I don't know that I can, what Edward Snowden said himself, he wouldn't have felt the need to do that if those, those safeguards had been allowed to work the way that they should have. Part of this happens because of overreach and... I would use the word hubris on the part of people. General Michael Hayden, I think, is a perfect example where you see hubris. I think you see it with the CIA head Brennan right now, too. The way he's treating um, the people who are his constitutional overseers in the Senate and people who bend over backwards, like Dianne Feinstein, 
to be on the CIA side of things are, is another example to me of, of not just hubris, but people who almost give you an impression of contempt for the Constitution. So, yeah, I'm not very, um, not very sympathetic. Do you see um, parallels between this situation uh, and and any of the previous situations that you've dealt with in the historical podcast? I mean, sort of areas where, uh, in this case, it's the as you describe it, it's the intelligence community, but in in past the intelligence community and and militaries were much harder to separate from each other. Can do, do you? Does this have a historical analog to you, or is it a, or is it a unique creature of, of sort of modern American society? I think it's a unique creature of American society, and that's because most of these um, mo- most of these regimes or governments or societies in past history do not have the kinds of protections Americans enjoy. It's part of what makes us so special, right? I mean, you can go back to ancient Rome, and they didn't have a Fourth Amendment, so you're not going to run into these kinds of problems. Um, and, and this is why so many of the founders were so afraid of, of things like standing militaries and whatnot, because they saw the kind of dominoes that tumble once you start to go down that road. Some of these kinds of conversations and disagreements that we have are natural outgrowths of the sort of policies we pursue. Um, I mean, a perfect example is you know, why do we have to guard ourselves so carefully against people within our country and without our country who might want to hurt us? Say, for example, Middle Eastern terrorists. A person like yours truly might say, because we're over there in their countries, giving them a reason to want to strike back. I always think there are going to be people that want to hurt the United States. But I certainly think we increase those numbers exponentially when we're over in their country. They're not over in our country. And, and if, if you have a domestic disturbance and one person is over at another person's house, I think you have a logical assumption you can make and just say, well, wait a minute, what are you doing over in this other person's house? And so for me, it's an outgrowth of a lot of these interventionist policies. We end up having to increase the amount of domestic surveillance because we have more people angry with us because we're over in their part of the world causing trouble for their people. Rightly or wrongly, if you kill someone's family members, by mistake, I I never assume the United States is killing innocent people on purpose, but if we strike a terrorist and and there's some collateral damage and somebody hates us because of that, that, is that something that's difficult for us to understand? I don't think any Americans living today would be okay if the shoe were on the other foot. And that's always been the way that I try to judge these situations. If an Arab country were here striking their enemies on our soil and killing Americans by accident while doing so, we would be pretty extreme in the things that we would do to pay them back for us. That's a human reaction. And I think we end up having to then crack down now on our own people, um, parse the Fourth Amendment and all these things even more, because of policies that people who founded this country foresaw would be problematic if we went down that road. We invite some of these problems because of the kind of policies we pursue. And and the NSA and our intelligence agencies end up having to pick up pieces for that. Thanks very much for joining us. It's been a pleasure. Well, I appreciate this, and I, and I hope this makes sense. I, I, I do think the Ronald Reagan line about trust but verify when he was talking about the, the old Soviet Union – applies very well to our intelligence services, too. You have to have them. You need them. But but strict oversight is absolutely required in a free society, and not because those aren't patriots doing an important job for us, but because they've proven in the past they're not always led by people who are as concerned with our constitutional freedoms as they are with finding the easiest, best, and most productive way to do their job. The Lawfare Podcast is produced in cooperation with the Brookings Institution. Our music, as always, is performed by the Right Honorable Sophia Yan. You need to help us promote the Lawfare Podcast. Tweet it, share it on Facebook, take an Instagram photo of yourself listening to the Lawfare Podcast, berate your friends. Thanks for listening.